الحمد للہ وصلاۃ وسلام علی رسول اللہ وعلیٰ علیہ صاحب اجمعین اما آباد اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اردو الا سبیل رب کا بلکمہ ولما عزد الحسنہ وجاد ملت حسن رب شری صدری ویسلی عمری وحل العقدۃ من لسانی افق قولی I welcome all the viewers of the Peace TV Network, the Peace TV English, the Peace TV Urdu, the Peace TV Bangla and the Peace TV Chinese as well as the viewers on my four social media platforms which are the Facebook, the YouTube, the Instagram and Twitter. I welcome all the viewers with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, mercy and and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. Today, I welcome you to the program Ask Dr. Zakir, Season 4, Session 6. This is the last session of this season. You are most welcome to ask any questions on Islam and comparative religion or any question which a non-Muslim may have posed to you and you were unable to reply. Or any question that you found on the media which you required a reply to, this is your opportunity. You can ask your question on any of my four social media platforms, but the best is that you text your question on the WhatsApp as a text message, mentioning your question in brief along with your name, your profession, the city and country of origin to the WhatsApp number plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. I repeat plus six zero double one two one double three double three six zero. We will take the first question on the WhatsApp. <clears throat> the first question is from Amirul Islam, India. Is it permissible for a Muslim wife to use her husband's surname? A similar question is posed by Naira Momin, Maharashtra, India. Is it permissible for a woman to adopt her husband's name or surname after marriage? A similar question is posed by Liza Ahmed from USA. Is it permissible to change one's own surname and adopt the last name of husband after marriage? There are several questions all related to the same topic. I have just selected four of them. The fourth question of the similar type is Assalamu alaikum. I am Adil from Tanzania. Dr. Naik, I believe you and your family have tried their best to live up to the Quran and Sunnah. Alhamdulillah. But do you agree with Ibn Majah 2599 and Say Al Jami 6104, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Whoever calls himself by other than his father's name will be cursed by Allah, his angels and the people. In Quran, chapter 33, verse 5, is the Quran, chapter 33, verse 5, applicable to only men or women too? If you agree, then why is your wife being addressed as Farat Zakir Naik? There are several questions on the same topic, that is, can a Muslim woman, after marriage, change her surname to the surname of the husband, or can she adopt the name of the husband as the middle name? And the last question opposed that I am following Quran and Sunnah to the best of my ability, Alhamdulillah. But why have you allowed your wife to keep her name Farazakir Naik? Don't you believe? In the hadith of Ibn Majah, hadith of Ibn Majah, which says that the Prophet said that those who call themselves anyone besides the name 
of the father, then Allah will curse, the angels will curse, and human beings will curse. And, do, do, and don't you believe in the verse of the Quran, Surah Adab, chapter 3, verse number 5. Before we delve into this topic of can a woman adopt the name of her husband or the surname of the husband, I would like to first tell you the background about how did it come about that women started adopting the name of their husbands. It's been a practice since ages and centuries, whether it be a Muslim society or a non-Muslim society, that the people are called by the name of their father, whether Muslim or non-Muslim society. It started in the Middle Ages, in the 11th century, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16th onwards, that the woman after marriage starting adopting the name of the husband as well as the surname of the husband and this is called as the law of coverture initially in the middle ages when this law was introduced that the woman after marriage should be named after the husband and the surname of the husband should be adopted the main reason actually was to subdue the woman and to see to it that she is covered therefore the law of coverture she's covered by the husband's name that means whatever she does is in the name of the husband so indirectly all the property belongs to the husband the children belong to the husband even she herself her body belongs to the husband and this was in the olden days where women were subdued and they were subjugated and she didn't have the right to own properties she didn't have the right, even after she was married, to own any property or to sell any property. Alhamdulillah, Islam, when it was introduced about 1400 years ago when the Quran was revealed, Alhamdulillah, Islam 1400 years back and our beloved Prophet were the first to uplift the woman and they gave the right to own, they gave the right for the woman to own property and to dispose the property without the permission of the husband or anyone if she owns it. And this right was given 1300 years before the Western world. In the Western world, it was in 1848, the first time in USA under the Married Women's Property Act that a woman was allowed to own a property without the name of the husband and she was allowed to dispose. And it was in 1882 in USA in, uh, in, in UK, it was the first time in UK in 1882 that a woman was permitted to own or dispose of property without the permission of the husband under the same act, marriage, a married woman's property act. Imagine, first time in the Western world, 1300 years after Islam, that is hardly, hardly about 72 years before or hardly 172 years before a woman was allowed in America to own or disown the property and it is hardly 138 years before that in UK in Europe a woman was allowed to own or disown the property and Islam gave this right to the woman 14 years ago for more details you can refer to my talk on women rights in Islam so this law of the woman adopting the name of the husband was mainly so that she gets completely covered by the husband's name and everything belongs to the husband but after the marriage pro after the marriage property women's marriage property act this became irrelevant so when it started in the middle ages from the 11th century to the 16th century in uk it became more prevalent in the early part of the 17th century that women were made to adopt the name of the husband as well as the surname of the husband and then it kept on increasing and then it became a law. There were some ladies and some women who objected that no, they will continue with the name, with the maiden name and the maiden surname. And they made cases and this kept on for many years until as late as 1972 in USA, a law was passed that a woman has the right to continue with the maiden name and surname and she also has the right if she wants to adopt the name of the husband 
so now the law that was put into place to subdue the women no longer holds good after the married after the married women's property act came into picture and so it doesn't make a difference whether she adopts the name of the husband or not she was independent alhamdulillah but now today in the world even though most of the countries permit a woman to choose whether she wants to continue with her maiden name and surname or does she want to adopt the name or the surname of the husband majority today in the non muslim world in the western world they adopt the name of the husband and the surname of the husband after marriage very few continue with the maiden surname now what are the pros and cons in today's world whether to continue with the maiden name for a woman after she married or it is better for her to adopt the name of the husband and the surname of the husband the reason why it came into existence the coverture law is no longer existing today so the main intention was to subdue the women now no longer that is valid now let us see what are the pros and cons the advantages that we can find today in a woman after marriage continuing a maiden surname is that she may love her maiden surname and she wants to continue with that that's one good reason The other reason may be the hassles of documentation that she has to change the name from her maiden surname to the husband's surname. These two are the main advantages in continuing with the maiden surname. But there are more advantages today in the woman adopting the name of the husband and the husband's surname. Number one, but naturally after marriage, the woman. she goes to the house of the husband and she joins the family of the husband now when she is joining the husband family if she maintains the maiden name which is permissible by law what islam says will come to it later on which is permissible by most of the laws today in the western country but if she maintains the maiden name she will be like an alien having a different name in a family where the husband the in-laws father in law mother in law all of them have a different surname so for her to assimilate in the new family she is joining if her name is the same it is much more comfortable number 2 once she marries the man and she becomes the wife of her husband if she adopts the name of the husband and the surname of the husband it's much more easier for her to be come apart with the husband for example they'll be addressed as mr and mrs so and so or like mr and mrs naik or mr and mrs zakir naik it's easier and when they move around for the wife to be identified as the wife of the husband if the name is same and the surname is same they can easily be identified if the surname is different people will not know by name whether the lady along with the man is the wife or not The third reason is that when children are born but natural children cannot have two surnames and usually they'll adopt the surname of the father so imagine the children will have a different surname and the mother will have a different surname so how will she identify that these are my children how will the people come to know that she is the mother of these children so when she adopts the surname of the husband and even the middle name of the husband and the children also have the middle name of the husband and the surname of the husband it is easy to identify who is the mother and it becomes like a full family so these reasons if you analyze for a woman after she marries adopting the middle name of the husband and the surname of the husband is more practical now let us come to the ruling what does islam say regarding this and finally i'll give the reply why i have allowed my wife to adopt my name and my surname as far as the scholars in islam are concerned that is it permissible for a muslim woman to adopt the name 
of the husband and the surname of the husband, the majority of the scholars says it is permitted. However, there is a minority group of scholars who say it is haram, it is not allowed. I'll first discuss, I'll first discuss the evidence given by this minority scholars who say that it is prohibited, it is haram, and then I'll come to the argument of the other scholars who say it is permitted. For anything to be made haram in Islam, you require evidence either from the Quran or from the Sahih Hadith. For anything to say it is fard also, you require evidence from the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. So, so for anyone to say that adopting the name of the husband or the surname of the husband after marriage for a woman is prohibited, they require clear cut evidence from the Quran or from the Sahih Hadith. Without that, they cannot say. The small group of scholars who say, that women cannot adopt the surname of the husband or the name of the husband. They give the evidence of the Quran of Surah Azab, chapter number 33, verse number 5. He says that call them with the names of their father. It is juster in the sight of Allah. So this verse of the Quran, Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 5, which was also quoted by one of the questioner. It says that call them with the name of their father. It is just in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they quote the hadith of a beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa which is mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, word number 5, hadith number 4326, where the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said that anyone who calls him the son of anyone Besides the father, paradise will be forbidden for him. He will not be allowed to enter paradise. It's a clear cut hadith. This hadith is also repeated in Sahih Muslim, point number four, hadith number 3794, in which our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that anyone who claims that he belongs to someone else besides his father intentionally, then the curse of Allah and the angels and the people will be on him. So this hadith is muttafiq alaykh. The highest category is then Bukhari and Muslim both. The earlier hadith of Bukhari, volume number 5, hadith number 4, 3, 2, 6 says that any person who says he is the son of anyone besides the father intentionally then he will never enter paradise. Paradise will be forbidden for him. So this is clear cut. The same hadith is also repeated in Ibn Majah, volume number three, hadith number 2609, where it says that a beloved Prophet Muhammad said that any person who claimed that he belongs to someone else besides his father, there will be the curse of Allah and the angels and all the people on him. Now regarding anyone claiming to be the son of anyone besides his original father, there is an ijma among the scholar. It is prohibited for anyone to say that he is the son of so and so man who is not his father. There is no two doubt about it at all. All the scholars, 100%, anyone who has the basic knowledge of Islam will agree that if you attribute anyone's name besides your real father, as a father it is haram, there is no two doubt about it, there is no two different opinion. The difference of opinion is that can a woman after marriage adopt the name of the husband or the surname of the husband. This Quranic verse doesn't speak at all about the wife, can she adopt or not, or whether she can adopt the name of the husband or not, or the surname of the husband or not. Neither do these hadith speak about that. This is the interpretation of the scholars. This group of scholars, including if you read the fatwa of the committee of Saudi Arabia, that is Lajna in Saudi Arabia, the fatwa council, they say that it is haram for a woman to adopt the name or the surname of the husband. But the Quranic verse doesn't say that. It is their understanding of the Quranic verse. Now, let us see the arguments of the majority of the scholars who say it is mubah, it is permissible for a Muslim woman 
to adopt the name or the surname of the husband. The verse of the Quran that they quoted of Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 5, in context we have to read verse number 4 also. Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 4 says that nor are your adopted sons your sons. It is only the way you speak. That means the Quran says the sons we adopt are not actually your sons. It is only a way of speech. And then the next verse says that call not them with the name besides that of their fathers. And the verse continues. It is just here. It is just here in the sight of Allah. And if someone does it by mistake and unintentionally, Allah is forgiving. Rahman or Rahim is forgiving and most merciful. That means if you unintentionally say that the person belongs to someone else besides the real father and your intention wasn't that, then Allah will forgive you. Allah is Rahman or Rahim. Now this verse of the Quran is mainly talking about adopted son. And in context of Surah Azab, you come to know that beloved Prophet Sallallahu his adopted son was Zaid. May Allah be pleased with him. And in this context, it says that he is your adopted son, but not your real son. And then the marriage is there further on. So this world doesn't speak at all about wife when they can they adopt the name of the husband or not. Now, when we read the Quran, if these scholars say, the first group, a small group, a minority, that it is prohibited for a woman to adopt the name of the of the husband or to be called as the husband or the wife of so and so. There are several verses in the Quran in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says wife of so and so. If you read Surah Imran chapter number 3 verse number 35, Allah says the wife of Imran. Imratu Imran. Wife of Imran. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Tahrim chapter number 66 verse number 10 the wife of Nuh alayhi salam, the wife of Lut alayhi salam. So if addressing someone as the wife of so and so is prohibited, then how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran himself addresses the wives of the Prophet as wife of Nuh alayhi salam, wife of Lut alayhi salam. Did not Allah know the name of their fathers? The next verse, Surah Tahrim chapter number, chapter number 66, verse number 11, says wife of Iran. When talking about the wife of Pharaoh, how she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I would like to exchange the wealth in this world for a house in Jannah close to you. So Allah says, wife of Pharaoh, did not Allah know that she was the daughter of which person? Who was the father of that woman? Of course he knew. One verse in the Quran that I know, where Allah talks about daughter of any of the women, it is the next work of Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, verse number 12, where Allah says that Maryam ibn Imran, Maryam, Maryam bint Imran, Maryam the daughter of Imran. Why? Because Maryam ibn Salam did not have any husband. So here, the only name of any woman taken in the Quran is Maryam al Salam. And in the Quran, Allah refers her as Maryam bint Imran, Maryam the daughter of Imran. Because Maryam al Salam wasn't married. Isa alayhi salam was born from a virgin birth. So here we realize in the Quran that more often, and there are various other verses in the Quran, wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, wife of Aziz, several places in the Quran. So more often Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the woman as wife of the husband's name than the daughter of the father. In no way I'm trying to tell you that telling the wife of so and so is better than talking about the daughter and so and so. No, not at all. I'm only saying that it is very well permissible. The verse that they quote of Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 5 prohibiting a woman to take the name of the husband is out of context at all. It is talking about adopted sons. And all the scholars unanimously agree that no human being, whether a girl or a boy, whether a man or a woman, can call anyone else besides the real father as a father. This is talking about father, lineage, it is haram and all the scholars agree with that. But that doesn't mean that a woman after marriage cannot adopt the name 
of the husband or the surname of the husband. So the majority of the scholars says it is permitted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has referred to the woman as the wife of Nuh alayhi salam, wife of Nuh alayhi salam, wife of Iran, wife of Aziz, wife of Imran. Even if you read the hadith, when the hadith speaks about the wife of the Firon, the hadith says, Asiya, the wife of Firon. Doesn't say Asiya, the daughter of so and so. Even I don't know who is the father of Asiya. So if it was prohibited, why is it mentioned the hadith? Furthermore, if you read, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number two, hadith number 1466, that the Zainab, may Allah be pleased with her, she was discussing that is it permissible for her to give charity or zakat to her husband and to the orphans who are under her care and protection. So she wants to ask the Prophet and when she goes to the Prophet, before that she meets Nabi Lal, may Allah be pleased with him. So she says that why don't you ask the Prophet that is it allowed for me to give charity to my husband and to the orphans who are under my protection. So Bilal may Allah be pleased with him, goes to the Prophet and says that there are some women who are asking that can they give charity to the husband and to the orphans who are under the care. So Prophet says, who are they? So Bilal may Allah be pleased with him, says Zainab. So Prophet says, which Zainab? So Bilal may Allah be pleased with him, replies Zainab, the wife of Abdullah ibn Masood. He doesn't say Zainab, the daughter of so and so. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Yes, it is permitted. She'll get double ajar for paying for the ajar for the charity, ajar for the zakat, and ajar for helping the relatives. If it was wrong for anyone to call any of the women to be called as the wife of so and so, wife of the husband, the Prophet would have objected. The Prophet would have told Hazrat Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him, that why are you saying? wife of Abdullah ibn Masood, you should say daughter of so and so. Prophet didn't object. If the Prophet didn't object, that means it is permissible. There are various hadith, several for which you can prove it is permitted for a woman to be called after the name of the husband. If you read Sai Bukhari, volume 1, hadith number 183, Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, he says, I went to sleep into the house of Maimuna, wife of the Prophet, who was my aunt. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him, says, I went to sleep into the house of Maimuna, the wife of the Prophet, Jawzan Nabi, means the wife of the Prophet. Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him. If it was wrong to call a woman the wife, of the husband, he would never have said wife of the Prophet. That means it is permitted. The Prophet permitted, the Sahabas did that. Further, if you read the Hadith of Sayyid Bukhari, volume number one, Hadith number 850, it speaks about Umm Salma, the wife of the Prophet. Now, here also, wife of the Prophet, that means permitted. And Umm Salma, the name is Umm Salma. Mother of Salama. Who was Umm Salama? Umm Salama was, Salama was the wife of the Prophet and she was called the mother of Salama. Who was Salama? Salama was the son of the previous husband of Umm Salama. So if she can be called as the mother of Salama, that means you can be called as mother of somebody else. Not that you have to be called as Bintid so and so. That means this verse is mainly referred, this hadith which says prohibition is that you cannot attribute someone else besides your original father and call somebody else your father like you do in adoption that is prohibited. Otherwise by name you can very well call wife of so and so, mother of so and so, it's permitted. And if they say, yes, I do agree with you. The normal practice in the Muslim world is to call the name as daughter of so-and-so or the son of the father or daughter of the father. This is the majority. But there are exceptions, many exceptions. For example, 
Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. May Allah be pleased with him. We know that he was a blind person. He was the Muazzin of the Prophet. And we know in Surah Abasa, the whole Surah was revealed when he comes and wants to speak to the Prophet, when he's having a discussion with the chiefs of Makkah and the Prophet frowns and a verse is revealed and a full Surah is revealed. And whenever the Prophet met him, he used to say that because of you, Allah remembered me. What was his name? Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. Means Abdullah, the son of mother of Maktoum. That means he was called the son of his mother. It's not 100% must that you should be called as son of your father. That is a general term, yes, normally. But if you are called as the son of your mother, that's permitted. Because there is not saying that his original father is somebody else. If someone says and attributes a person who is not his father as the father, that is haram, like in adoption. There are other examples. For example, Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Who was he? He was the son of Ali ibn Talib. May Allah be pleased with him. He was the fourth caliph of Islam. The fourth caliph of Islam, his son from the other wife. He was not called as the son of Ibn Ali. No. His son Muhammad wasn't called Muhammad ibn Ali. He was called Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Hanafiya was the wife of Hazrat Ali. May Allah be pleased with him. So his son was called as the son of the mother, not son of the father. No one objected to that. None of the Sahaba said what he did was wrong. So here imagine the son of the fourth caliph of Islam, he is called by the name son of the mother. Muhammad ibn al Hanafiya. Hanafiya was the wife of Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. So he was identified as the son of the mother, not as the son of Hazrat Ali, may Allah be pleased with him. It is permitted. And I'll give you, there are many examples, you can speak for hours on this. I'll just give one more example because. I'll give the example of those who consider one of the mujaddid of Islam. We know and even I respect him and I revere him. It is Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Now Ibn Taymiyyah, Taymiyyah is not the name of the father of Ibn Taymiyyah. Who was Taymiyyah? Taymiyyah was the grandmother or the great grandmother of Ibn Taymiyyah. His real name was Ahmad. He got the title Sheikh ul Islam. He got the title Taqiyuddin. So his name was Sheikh ul Islam Taqiyuddin Ahmad Ibn Abdul Halim Ibn Abdul Salam. And the name is continuous. His father's name was Abdul Halim. So his real name was Ahmad Ibn Abdul Halim. But he was called as Ibn Taymiyyah. And Taymiyyah was the grandmother of the great grandmother of Ibn Taymiyyah and she was a scholar. She was very famous and known for her literary works and many of her male descendants have taken this laqab as Ibn Taymiyyah. And even Sheikh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah got that laqab and in that tribe where he lived it was common to be identified by the name of the woman, one of the ascendants or maybe mother, grandmother or great grandmother. It was a custom. It's permitted. That doesn't mean they're going against the verse of the Quran, Surah Azab, or it doesn't mean they're going against the Hadith in which the Prophet said, you don't call your father anyone except your original father intentionally. Nowhere. Everyone knows, who knows the history, that Ibn Taymiyyah means that he was the great-grandchild of Taymiyyah, a lady. The real father's name is Abdul Halim. And in Saudi Arabia, of course, these scholars who have given the fatwa, it is prohibited, all of them respect Ibn Taymiyyah. So do you mean to say Ibn Taymiyyah did a sin? Was it haram? So when you read the fatwa, it says haram to keep the name of the, the woman, to adopt the name of the husband or the surname. I disagree with it, it totally. Though I respect the scholars in the Lajna of the Saudi Arabia Fatwa Council, I respect them, I revere them, but when they differ the opinion, as Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 59. 
Atullah tu Rasul, obey Allah and obey the messenger. But if they differ, go back to Allah and his Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the messenger and the scholars, Ulul Amr, those who have been given the authority. But if they differ, go back to Allah and his Rasul. So according to me, for a woman to adopt the name of the husband and the surname of the husband after marriage is muba, it is permissible. It's not a fard. If she wants to continue with the name, her maiden surname, and continue with being called as the daughter of the father, it is perfectly fine. And this is what is practiced in most of the Muslim countries. But in most of the non-Muslim countries, in the Western countries, most of them, majority almost all, they adopt the name of the husband and the surname of the husband. If you ask me, I personally am a Dai and I keep on traveling in different parts of the world, especially the non-Muslim countries, and Allah has blessed me, I've traveled to more than 50 countries, giving lectures, etc. And most of the time I've taken my wife along, I've taken my children along. Now imagine my wife, the fourth question asked, that Zakir follows Quran and Sunnah to the best of the ability. I don't claim I follow 100%. Yes, Alhamdulillah, I try my level best. And if I come to know it is wrong, I immediately stop it. I don't claim I'm 100% perfect, but Alhamdulillah, I try and follow whatever I come to know, unless it's your nafs which you cannot control or you get angry, those are things which are different. But if it is haram, I can change the name of, I can change the name of my wife immediately. But after doing research, I know for sure it is permissible. Personally, for me, when I keep on traveling, I would prefer my wife having my name in her name and the surname, my surname, because when we travel, imagine when we check in the hotel. And if my wife has the name of her father, my wife's name is Farath, father's name was Riyasat, and her maiden surname was Khan. So if I check in the hotel, Farath Riyasat Khan, checking in the hotel, staying overnight with Dr. Zakir Naik. It may get ideas that who will Dr. Zakir Naik check in the hotel with? Imagine staying overnight. And we know the hadith of the Prophet that once in the morning, during Fajr Salah, just before that, the Prophet was talking to his wife in the dark, and one of the Sahabas passes by. So he calls the Sahaba and he says, This is my wife. The Sahaba says, Astaghfirullah. Of course, of course they are Rasulullah. Who else can it be? So he says, you may never know. There is a shaitan that is running and you may think otherwise. Imagine the Prophet of Allah. The most best example where Allah says that he standeth on the highest standard of character. Surah Kalam chapter 68 verse number 4. And in Surah Azab chapter 33 verse number 21, you will find the most beautiful pattern of conduct in the Prophet. The Prophet goes out of the way to tell the Sahaba that this is my wife. So that the shaitan doesn't come. And imagine if I have to check in the hotel, I'm traveling in different countries, especially non-Muslim country. If I go into a Muslim country, which you know that the name is there of the person, the woman after marriage also continues with the name of the father and doesn't adopt the husband's name is different. But if I'm traveling to a non-Muslim country for doing dawah along with my wife and imagine what will they think? Imagine if my wife goes with my son and my wife has to keep her maiden name, Farad Riyasat Khan, checking in the hotel with Farag Zakir Naik. A person would think otherwise. And you cannot say what they're thinking is wrong. So I personally feel it is better and much better. And especially now, previously it was different. Now, where you can have live-in relationship, even with a woman who you have not married. A man and woman have not married can stay for months together, years together, can have children, no problem, they maintain their name. In this situation, if the wife maintains the name, especially in a non-Muslim society where it is almost common that the woman adopts the name of the husband after marriage, I would personally prefer that the woman should, after marriage, especially in situations like me, Islamically it is mubah, but practically it is better. And those who give the fatwa that it is wrong, they fail to realize that in English language, after a woman is married, she is called as Mrs. So if the name is Mrs. Farah Zakir Naik, it is understood 
Mrs. Farat, the wife of Zakir Naik. Before she married, she called as Miss. So if it is Miss Farat Riyasat Khan, it means Farat, who is the daughter of Riyasat Khan. Very easy. So in English language, when there is a Miss prefix before the name, that means she is not married, and the middle name is the father's name, and the surname is the surname of the father. If Mrs. is added, it is understood that the middle name is husband's name, and the surname is is the husband's surname. In Arabic, when you call someone, you say Ibn Farik Ibn Zakir Nai. That means Farik, son of Zakir Nai. There is no doubt. But no one here is saying Farad Ibn Zakir Nai. No, Bismillah. What they are saying is Mrs. Farad Zakir Nai. So those people who say it is haram, they, they may not be knowing the culture and they may not be aware of the English language. So if you are living in a Muslim country and, you men, and the woman after marriage maintains the name perfectly allowed, it is her choice, she can keep it, no problem at all. And there everyone knows this is the custom, no problem at all. If they are living in a non-Muslim society or if they keep on traveling abroad, imagine even a Muslim staying in a Muslim country from the Gulf country goes with his wife who has the name of a father and checks in the hotel maybe in France or UK or USA so and if someone doubts that this person is traveling with a girlfriend or someone who's not the wife they have the right you cannot say it is wrong so I personally feel that if you're living in a non-Muslim society or if you're traveling very often in a non-Muslim society I would say that for practical purposes, especially now living live in relationship is allowed. Even in many of the Gulf countries, now it has started that you can. Previously, the law was there that man and woman cannot check in until their husband and wife. Now, that law has been removed. So in such a situation, I would personally prefer that because of anyone laying allegation or having a doubt, to remove the doubt, I personally would feel it is preferable that a woman maintains or keeps the name of the husband and the surname of the husband not islamically for practical purpose of the world otherwise islamically it is muba whether the woman maintains the name of her father and the maiden surname perfectly fine or if she adopts the name of the husband both are permissible so according to me it is muba and as far as the fourth question is concerned according to me quran and sunnah gives you the option and gives you the permission for a woman after she's married, either she maintains the name of her father and the surname of the father or she has the option of adopting the name of the husband and the surname of the husband. Hope that answers the question. The second question, hi Dr. Zakir, I have watched most of your videos and I am inspired with your logical answers. I am Prakash from Nepal. Allah has sent 124,000 messengers on the face of the earth. Allah knows everything in the past or future. Then may be, then may be Hindu God Ram and Krishna were messengers of Allah. If Allah would have mentioned one of the Hindu gods, if Allah would have mentioned one of the Hindu gods in the Quran, like Jews and Christians, then many Hindu would have thought of converting to Islam. Allah must have known by the year 2020, 1.2 billion Hindus would exist on the face of the earth. Why Allah did not mention any Hindu god? in the Quran or as it is the third largest religion in the world. Brother Prakash from Nepal who is a Hindu I asked a very good question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has mentioned the messengers of the Jews and the Christians. Why hasn't he mentioned the messengers who have come to the Hindus, you know, who the Hindus believe to be God? 
as the hadith of Bukhari, which he heard from my lecture, that our beloved Prophet said there were 124,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Allah would have mentioned the name at least of one of the messengers who have been sent to the Hindus, who they consider to be God, maybe Ram or maybe Krishna, and Allah surely knows the past and the future. Allah may have also known that in the year 2020, there will be 1.2 billion Hindus, which would be the third largest religion. So why didn't Allah mention the name of the messenger who was sent to the Hindu people, who they consider to be God? It's a very good question, a very logical question. For a normal human being who has a normal logic, your question is very appropriate. But we fail to realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine wisdom, he is far superior than the human logic. Let me give you an example. Today, which is the largest spoken language in the world? As the native language today we know, the largest spoken native language in the world is Mandarin, Chinese language. More than 800 million people speak that. If you count the first two languages, first language and second language, then 1.2 billion people speak Mandarin. English, as the first native language, is very less, somewhere close to 400 million. As a second language and first language, about 1 billion people speak. It is less than Chinese. If you take as the first, second and third language put together, then English becomes number one. About 2 billion people speak English as the first language, second language or third language. So we know today in the world, the two largest spoken languages are English and Mandarin. So same question can be asked by another non-Muslim that why did Allah not reveal the Quran in Mandarin or English? Did not Allah know that in the year, in the year 2020, there will be 1.2 billion people speaking Mandarin? Or if you count as first, second and third languages, 2 billion people would speak English? Of course Allah knew. The reply to this question is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran on the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, who was born in Arabia and the Quran was revealed in Arabia. So if the Quran has to be revealed on a messenger, it cannot be revealed to a messenger whose mother tongue is, is something else. His mother tongue is Arabic and Quran is revealed in Chinese or Quran is revealed in Mandarin or English. It is absurd. So if it is revealed on the last and final messenger Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, it has to be in the mother tongue and the mother tongue of Prophet was Arabic. And the people around the Prophet it was revealed in Arabic, the people spoke Arabic. So, but naturally, because it was revealed in the land of Arabia, it has to be in Arabic. You cannot ask the question that later on, <coughs> after 1000 years, after 1400 years, the largest spoken language will be Chinese, would be English, so it should be revealed in English. Maybe at that time also, Arabic may not be the most widely spoken language, but because it was revealed, in Arabia, it has to be in Arabic. Because it was revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an Arab, it had to be in Arabic. There are various reasons I can give you why Arabic is the best language. Amongst all the languages in which the religious scriptures were revealed, the only living language in the world today, in which all the various scriptures of the various world religions are revealed, it is Arabic. Arabic is the living language. The languages in which the other scriptures were revealed, like the Bible, in Arabic, in Greek, like the Hindu scriptures in Sanskrit, they are dead languages. So Allah knew that it was revealed in the language which will remain a live language forever. And Arabic, Alhamdulillah, today is spoken by 300 to 350 million people in the world. It's a living language. Furthermore, Arabic is a divine and noble language as compared to English or Chinese. Furthermore, one word in Arabic many a times have got various meanings and many a times for one word there are many Arabic words for example for the word of horse some scholars say there are 70 words for the horse some say 100 words are there only for the word horse this is rich language for one animal 
there are 70 different types of names and one word has got many meanings so this is the beauty of the language it is a noble language it's a divine language even while writing for example muhammad meem ha dal if you write it in english m u h a m m a d so if you count the arabic muhammad is one third of the english muhammad the less space required and the various reasons i can keep on giving you can refer to my video cassette al quran should be read with understanding so now we come to know that allah subhanahu wa taala in his divine wisdom chose arabic as a language which is going to be a living language it's a divine language you cannot compare it with english at all and if you compare in english language i use the same word you for a second person for male also you for a female also you for dual also it is you for plural also it is you in arabic i have got six different words anta anti antum antunna for you male it's a different word anta for you female anti in english is the same antum antunna for dual is different for plural is different so imagine six different words are there in arabic language and in english you say you you will not come to know whether the person the you is referred to is a male or a female it is plural or singular it's the same so arabic is a rich language so if you logically see and consider alhamdulillah allah in allah in divine wisdom has revealed the quran in arabic it's the best choice as with a limited knowledge so if it were revealed in english it was revealed in chinese and mandarin it would have been better no yes there are translations in most of the major languages of the world in more than 100 languages it may not be the same as the quran because quran cannot be translated in english you can have the translation it can come close to the meaning of arabic but will not match the beauty that is the reason when you recite the quran the tears roll out even those who don't understand they enjoy it the rhythm in the quran the recitation the tajweed it is not there in english it's not there in mandarin so allah in his divine wisdom he knows what he does let me give one more example we know the last and final messenger prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was the best exemplary human being and many non muslims have claimed that and michael h hart in his book the 100 most influential people right from adam till the present time he puts muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam number 1 number 2 he puts isaac newton we know the last and final messenger he was unlettered he could not read he could not write now someone comes and tells me wouldn't it have been better if the last and final messenger everything same but he had the same scientific knowledge as isaac newton imagine number 1 number 2 joined together won't it be better let me remind you that when michael h hart puts muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam number 1 isaac newton number 2 uh, jesus christ peace be upon number 3 the gap between the first and second is huge he goes on to say that saint paul which he puts i think as number 6 that jesus christ peace be upon him number 3 and saint paul as number 6 put together are no way close to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the influence in the full world imagine and the reason why allah subhanahu wa taala has kept the last and final messenger as an ummi as unlettered is given in surah an kabut chapter number 29 verse number 48 that we have kept the messenger don't you know that you were unlettered and you weren't able to transcribe before this otherwise the blabbers of vanity would have doubted means the enemies of islam would have said ah he is a very good he is literate he might have written the quran a point hardly big enough even to ha- hang a fly it's a nonsensical point even the best human being in the world cannot write the quran but allah subhanahu wa taala in his divine wisdom purposely kept the last and final messenger as unlettered as illiterate so that even the flimsiest excuse is not given quran is the miracle of miracles so we may think in a divine wisdom prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam best example very good character etc if it would have been like isaac newton put together wouldn't it have been the best i would say no allah knows what is the best coming to your question that why did not allah subhanahu wa taala 
mention the name of the messenger who was sent to the Hindu people who they consider as God. And I've said that in my early answer that our beloved prophet said there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. By name only 25 are mentioned in the Quran. Maybe Ram is a messenger of God. Maybe Krishna is a messenger of God. But I don't know. I cannot say Ram alayhi salam. I cannot say Krishna alayhi salam because there is no way mentioned in the Quran the Hadith that they were messengers. Maybe. But even if they were messengers, they were sent for those people at that time. Today we have to follow the last and final messenger which was sent for the whole of humanity that is Prophet Muhammad bin Pippan. <coughs> now coming to your question. They did not Allah know that in year 2020 Hindus would be approximately 1.2 billion and I agree with you. The statistics, the latest statistics we have in 2015, the Hindus were about 1.1 billion and now after five years I agree with you, they may be close to 1.2 billion. The Muslims were 1.8 billion about five years back, now they are more than 2 billion. The Christian were 2.3 billion, now they are about 2.4 billion. About 31% of the world claim to be Christian, but in practice, very few of them practice. Muslims, about 25.7% are Muslims today. <clears throat> more than 2 billion people in the world population today, out of 7.8 billion people in the world, more than 2 billion are Muslims. I do agree with you that Hinduism today is the third largest language, the third largest followed religion in the world. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to mention the history of all the 124,000 messengers in the Quran, the Quran would have been maybe a thousand times more voluminous. Only by mentioning the example of 25 messengers, many human beings feel it difficult to complete the book. If imagine Allah wrote, therefore Allah says in the Quran, He mentions the stories of some of the messengers of the others, He doesn't. Then you would say, why didn't Allah mention the fourth largest people, the Buddhists? The Buddhists are more than half a billion today. And the thing can continue. If you read the Quran, the Quran, one third of the Quran is addressed to Bani Israel. Bani Israel? are the children of Israel. Most of the prophets out of the 25 prophets mentioned, majority are Jewish prophets. Isa alayhi salam was a Jew, but believed by the Christian. Most of the others mentioned, majority, almost all, they are Jews. And we know today, what is the population of the Jews? According to the census of 2015, Jews were 14 million, 0.2% of the world population. That time the world population was 7.2 billion. Now, maybe they are 15 million or 15 and a half million, 0.2%. And imagine, majority of the messengers mentioned are Jews. Did not, know Allah, did not Allah know that the Jews are going to become a minority? Allah mentions in the Quran among the messengers mentioned. Majority Jews, why? At that time when the Quran was being revealed, there were Christians and Jews present in Arabia. So if Allah spoke about, don't you remember the favor that Allah did to the Bani Israel? Don't you know this and that? It's questioning. So they were, they were shocked that how come this revelation mentions about Jews and Christians? And when they checked up in the scriptures, it was matching. So many things mentioned in the Quran. <coughs> <clears throat> so many things mentioned in the Quran about the previous messengers, they could have been verified by the scriptures available there with the Jews and the Christian. We spoke about Isa alayhi salam, the Christian could verify it. We spoke about Ibrahim alayhi salam, we spoke about Musa alayhi salam. So all these messengers, what is mentioned in the Quran, most of them could be verified. Imagine if in Arabia Allah spoke about the Hindu. A messenger sent to the Hindus and no one knew it would be weird. So that's the reason I believe what Allah did is the best. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82, that the people who will be the staunchest in enemy to the believers 
are those who will call themselves Jews and the pagans and the idol worshippers. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 82, the staunchest in enemy to the believers will be the Jews and the mushriks. And the closest in love will be those people who call themselves Christians. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows very well that the Jews will be less in population. But we know today, even if Jews are less in population, the Jews are controlling the world. We know that the Jews are controlling the world by the banks, the economy is in the hands, they are controlling by the media, most of the top media are owned by Jews, 0.2% only. USA is controlled by the Jews. So here we come to know that the 0.2% of the population is controlling the full world. So percentage wise, Allah should have mentioned about the Jewish prophets, but Allah knows. And Allah says that they will be the staunchest. Today if they want to prove that the Quran is wrong, what they should do? Okay, let us agree to be two years good to the Muslims. We will be very kind to them and the Quran will be proved wrong, but they will never do that. So what I believe that the Quran has mentioned about those messengers who people knew at that time when the Quran was revealed. But at the same time, Quran speaks about the idolaters, about the mushriks. When it talks about the mushriks, it includes the Hindus. So not that Hindus are left out. Indirectly they included. What Allah did in his divine wisdom, according to me, is he did not mention all the messengers of the various different about the Jews, about the Buddhists and all the different religions in the Quran, two voluminous. What Allah did in all the major scriptures of the different world religions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, alhamdulillah. Though the scriptures of the major world religions have been corrupted, have been manipulated, Allah saw to it that Tawheed was maintained in those scriptures and even the mention of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was maintained in the scriptures. So today if you read the Hindu scriptures, the Vedas, the, the Puranas, the Upanishads, it clearly speaks about Tawheed. It talks about the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There are more than 100 places in the Hindu scriptures, in the Vedas, in the Puranas, in the Upanishads, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is mentioned by name. His mother's name is mentioned, his father's name is mentioned, where he was born is mentioned, so much detail. Now I am asking you the question, is it more the chances, are there more chances for a Hindu to read his scripture or the chances of the Hindu to read the Quran? And the answer is, though the Hindus don't read the scriptures, but there are more chances the Hindu will read his scriptures than the Hindu reading the Quran. So Allah in his divine wisdom what he did, he did not add all the 124,000 messengers in the Quran, it would be too voluminous. What Allah did? In the major scriptures of all the world religions, even though they have changed, even though they have got corrupted, Alhamdulillah, in all the major world religious scriptures, whether it be the Bible, whether it be the Old Testament, whether it be the New Testament, whether it be the Hindu scriptures, whether it be the Vedas, whether it be the Puranas, whether it be the Upanishads, whether it be the Buddhist scriptures, whether it be the Gospel of Karis, Alhamdulillah, Tawheed is mentioned and the name of Muhammad is mentioned. So to reply to your question, Allah is more wise than us. What he did, he mentioned in the Hindu scriptures about the coming of the Prophet Muhammad And today that you find that mashallah there are thousands of Hindus accepting Islam. Thousands. Every day maybe thousands. Alhamdulillah, summa alhamdulillah. Every day out of the 1.2 billion, there are hundreds, maybe thousand, every day accepting Islam. Hundreds is for sure. Mashallah, every day out of the 1.2 billion, hundreds of them accepting Islam. Every day. Allah, Allah, maybe thousands also. Every day. Why? Because Allah in His divine wisdom has mentioned in the scripture, has spoken logically. And, and when anyone reads the Quran, the logical way talks about the Tawheed, about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, any logical person who is unbiased will accept the message of the Quran. And that is applicable to any human being. That is the reason Quran says that do, do not the men of understanding take heed. It is addressing to the men of understanding. So Alhamdulillah, Allah has used a better system than what you have asked. And that is the reason, MashaAllah, today Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. According to a survey that took place in, in 1834, uh, 1934, in a span of 50 years, 
in the Ridda Raja Al-Manager book, the religion which increased the maximum was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47% in the Ridda Raja Al-Manager book, also reproduced in the plain truth. Hinduism, only 117%. So we know that Islam is the fastest growing religion because it's a logical religion and Allah saw to it that the message of Islam will reach to each and every human being. Hope that answers the question. We have on the Facebook. Rakin Ibrahim Shamle, Sharir Nevzat Bozilet, Mohammed Yaqub Chawahan. A.T. Shorov, Bangladesh, Muhammad Hussain, Kurdad Al Mahdi, Abu Phillips, love you and your effort, Munim Sardar, hero of the world, Zakir Naik, Muhammad Amin, Abdul Akbar Afridi, love you, sir, I love you too, Firdos Ahmad Lone, my last mother, award you the best, Amin, Martin Kainin Smith, may Allah help us to learn from Dr. Zakir. Muhammad Saif Ahmad Apurbo, Mukarram Hussain from Bangladesh, Abu Tayyab, respect and love, Muhammad Saidur from Bangladesh, love you, I love you too, Shihab Bhayun, we, are, we love you, I love you too, Qardad Al Mahdi, Fatima Rida from Egypt, Muhammad Faiz Gujjar, Samad Ahmad, Nazmul Hassan from Bangladesh, Amir Hamza Sasoli from Pakistan, Malik Yusuf Chan, Lutfur Rahman, Muhammad Arafat. This was on the Facebook. We have on the YouTube Idam Anjum, Usman, Mehdi Arab. Muhammad Saad, Fiyazan Khan, Mehdi Arab, Siti Nabila Binte Izamuddin, Osama Binte Iftikar, Shehda Sheikh, Izar Anjum, Muhammad Saad, Shehda Sheikh, Zakir Naik, I give you a question on WhatsApp. Muhammad Saad, Mehdi Arab. Let me tell you, Alhamdulillah, that every session, just let me remind the viewers, Alhamdulillah, every session we receive about four or five thousand questions the WhatsApp, we receive about 15 to 20,000 questions on the Facebook and a few thousand questions on the YouTube. On an average, we receive more than 20,000 questions every session. And believe me, we have a team of people scanning the questions. We aren't able to read all the questions, but we try and read as many as we can. We do read a few thousand out of which they select and they give me approximately 100 questions every session. From those 100 questions, I keep and select approximately 20 to answer, out of which I'm able to answer sometimes 10, sometimes 15, sometimes less. And I keep on trying to answer questions that I club many of the questions together. I keep on, I see to it that I don't repeat the question I've already answered before. And inshallah, my aim is at least to cover about 500 questions every year. So by now we have already covered approximately more than 350 questions, alhamdulillah. We'll try our level best to cover as many questions as possible so that in the time to come, we'll have a data bank and we'll try and cover as many different variety of questions as possible.
Uh, the next question. I am Nadirul from Assam, India. Is profit sharing in a business allowed in Islam? I mean, if one of my partner invests money in my business and I give him fixed rate of profit or loss. Sharing profit is allowed in Islam and that is recommended, but you cannot give a fixed amount of profit for a fixed investment. For example, if your friend has invested maybe $100,000 and you said that every month I'm going to give $10,000 fixed, you cannot give a fixed amount, that will be riba. What you can do is you can give a fixed percentage of profit, that whatever profit I get, I will give 50%. You have invested $100,000, I have invested $100,000, we will share the profit 50-50 and then if you get 50,000 profit and you give half to him and half you keep, $25,000 to him, 25,000 to yourself, Giving a fixed percentage is permitted and that's what is given. You cannot give a fixed amount. If you give a fixed amount, that will be riba. Or maybe he put 50%, you put 50%, you're managing the business. Therefore, you say, because I'm managing the business, I will take 60%, I'll give you 40%, that is permitted. So the percentage can change depending upon how you mutually decide between your investor, between your friend and yourself. It can be as per the amount you have put in or it can be no, I'm giving time, therefore I'll require more money, no problem at all. Or he puts 100% profit, you only manage and you take 25%, give him 75%, you take 30%, give him 70%, that is permitted. Percentage of profit is permitted, but not a fixed amount. You cannot say that because you have put $100,000 every month, I will give you $5,000. So the end of the month, you'll get $50,000. That is haram. That will be riba. Fixed money for fixed getting fixed money for a amount of money given that is riba, it is interest, it is haram. But a fixed percentage of profit as the profit will keep on varying every month. So the percentage can remain fixed. The net money that's coming in is hand may keep on varying, no problem at all. But fixed money, it is riba, it is haram. Hope that's the question. The next question, my name is Muhammad Inayat. I am from Hyderabad, India. I am a student. My dad owns a shop in which he sells idols of Hindu religious gods. Is it permissible or haram? For anyone, for any Muslim to sell idols of gods of other religion is totally prohibited. In Islam, the biggest sin, the number one major sin is shirk. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah, if He pleases, He may forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, He'll never forgive. For anyone who done shirk, has strayed away far. So shirk associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including idol worship, it is haram, it is the biggest sin. And if someone sells idols of gods of other religions, whether Hindu religion or any other religion, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 2, that help each other in bir and taqwa, in virtue and righteousness, each Muslim should help one another. And the verse continues, but do not help one another in sin and transgression. That means in things which are sin, which are haram, which is transgression, don't help one another. So if you yourself may not be doing shirk, but if you are selling idols by which others are doing shirk, it is totally prohibited, it is haram, you should stop this business. You should tell your father that you should stop this business, it's a major sin and he cannot continue, irrespective of whatever profit he makes, he cannot sell idols because it is shirk. He should search for another business, change his business, this is totally haram. The next question, a Christian friend asked me, why didn't Allah save Muhammad and he let him die by a painful death? Well, Jesus was saved according to the Quran only. 
and he is alive in heaven, isn't this proof that Jesus was someone more than just a human prophet like the Quran claims? Brother Abdul Qadir, Brother Abdul Qadir from Algeria has asked a question. Saying that as Christian has said that according to the Quran, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was raised up alive, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died a painful death. So doesn't it mean that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was superior to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? First, let me correct you that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not die a painful death. He died a natural death at the age of approximately 63. He completed his mission. Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 3, Allah revealed that I have complete my favor unto you and I have chosen for you Islam. So the, his mission was complete. After his mission was complete, he had a peaceful death. He was aware that he would die. He informed that to his father, to, to the Sahabas also. And to say that why didn't Allah save him? Allah saved him many times. And we know from the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam that before Hijrah, the, the Arabs of Makkah, they had planned that one from each tribe will get together and they will stab and kill the Prophet so that the blame is divided equal in all the tribes and that will be safer. So when they plan and they go to kill, the abort, when they are about to kill him, they find out the person sleeping on the bed of the Prophet was somebody else. So Hazrat Ali may Allah be pleased with him and they don't kill him and Allah saves the Prophet. And while the Prophet is doing hijrah, when he goes into the cave, all these Arabs, the Mushrikeen, they follow him but they aren't able to catch him. And along with a beloved prophet was Abu Bakr may Allah be pleased with him. And he says that he is scared. So the prophet replies that we have with us Allah and he's sufficient to protect us. So Allah protected the prophet several times in Taif and various times. So to say that Allah didn't protect him is totally wrong. To say that the prophet had a painful death is totally wrong. He had a peaceful death after he completed the mission. Now coming to your main question. That why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised Isa alayhi salam alive and kept him in the heaven? Does it make him a superior prophet? I do agree with you, Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 158, that Allah raised up Isa alayhi salam alive and in other places also. The reason amongst all the 124,000 prophets that are sent on the face of the earth, Isa alayhi salam was the only messenger, the only prophet who Allah raises up alive. The reason is, all the prophets that came to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people as a whole, before they died, they believed that he was the messenger. Even though many people may not have agreed initially, but before the messenger or the prophet died, his people agreed that he was the messenger of God. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the only messenger, the only prophet whose people as a whole thought that he claimed divinity. They had a misconception. And there are various verses in the Quran which says in sorry, Maida chapter 5 verse number 72 that they are doing kuf, those who say that Allah is Jesus, the son of Mary. But said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O Chin of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. In no may shrik billah, anyone who associates partners with Allah, fakad haram malayur al jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. Wama vhon nar. Wama lis alamin min ansar, and fire shall be dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter. So it's very clear cut that there were most of the Christians believed that he claimed divinity, which was a misconception. He never said that. So the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised him up alive is because so that in his second coming, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, can tell to the Christians, to his followers, that he never claimed divinity. And Allah says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 16, that he will say, when Allah asks, that did you tell them to worship you? He said, you are my witness. I never told them to worship me, but I told them that, Uqbudullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbukum, who is my Lord and your Lord. So, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up Isa alayhi salam alive because he was the only messenger whose people mistook him to claim divinity. There was a misunderstanding. That doesn't mean that he was a higher prophet. 
Because there was a misunderstanding, Allah raised him up alive and Allah says in the Quran that he will be a sign for the Qiyamah. Before the world ends, Allah will send him down again. And there are verses in the Quran that say, well, Hadith, he will descend down and then the Hadith says that he will break the cross and he will kill the pig. He also said that he will kill the Dajjal, the various Hadith. So Isa alayhi salam, when he comes in the second coming, he will not come as the messenger of Allah. He will come as Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. Because the last and final messenger is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So when he comes, he will come as the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. He will not come as a messenger. So he's been raised up alive only so that he can clarify to the Christians in his second coming that he never claimed divinity. As far as Muhammad was concerned, most, all the Muslims, when the Prophet died, believed he was the messenger of God. There was no misconception. No one claimed him to be God. So because there was a misunderstanding and misconception as far as Isa was concerned, therefore Allah raised him up alive and he'll come in his second coming, not because he was superior. Hope that answers the question. The next question. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Saeed, a finance employee from Frankfurt, Germany. Family of three. My question is, we would like to buy a house since we don't want to pay rent forever and the prices are going high continuously. So there is no chance even in 10 to 15 years that I save money to buy a house here. The only option for a salary person like me is to get a bank loan. Would it be correct to do so? I have watched many videos from different Imams and scholars, but no one gives a clear answer, whether yes or no, or any alternative. There is an Islamic bank of Turkish people, which is also taking 2.5% profit per year and says this is according to Islam. However, I think they are doing the same as any other bank. The question posed by Brother Said from Frankfurt, from Germany, is that he cannot afford to buy a house, it is very expensive, so can he take a loan? No one has even clear that answer. As far as taking loan from a conventional bank, which involves interest, which involves riba, it is totally haram, it is prohibited. There are no less than eight places in the Quran where Allah uses the word riba, and it's clearly mentioned as haram. Allah also says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278 and 279, that give up your demands of riba. And if you give up not your demands of riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. That means if you involve yourself in giving or taking of riba, or giving or taking of interest, Allah says in the Quran, Allah and His Rasul will wage a war against you. And no human being in the world can face the Prophet or Allah when they wage war against you. So, but naturally it's haram and it is the twelfth major sin. According to Imam al dabi when he writes in his book, the Kabair, the major sins, he puts riba interest as the twelfth major sin. Yes, you can take a loan from Islamic bank. In Islamic bank, they give you a loan and they don't give you loan on riba or interest but they give you lame loan on Islamic principles which are approved by the Sharia. And there may be a service charge in uh, facilitating the loan and this is as per Sharia law. It is not fixed depending upon the time you take and the percentage of what you take. It is on Islamic Sharia principles. So you can very well take loan from Islamic bank which is not taking riba but taking service charge based on Islamic principles or you can take from Islamic organization which gives interest free loan. So the option that you have is taking taking from a conventional bank which charges interest is haram but you can very well take from Islamic bank so if you have a Turkish Islamic bank, very good, they are charging 2.5%, very good, you can easily afford it, it is halal, you can go ahead. Or if there are Islamic organizations, there are some Islamic organizations 
which do give loans for buying houses interest free absolutely without interest you can return installments you can take facility of that loan if it's available in germany or any other part taking from islamic bank is haram uh, is is uh, perfectly allowed taking from islamic bank is perfectly halal but taking from a conventional bank dealing with riba is prohibited Next question. Assalamu alaikum. Next question. Assalamu alaikum. I am Dr. Romana from Dhaka, Bangladesh. My husband is also a doctor, and we have a daughter. Mashallah. My husband has one elder brother who has three daughters, one elder sister who has one daughter and one son. My father-in-law is alive. He lives with us. Last year my husband has bought a flat by his own money which is totally earned by himself and not inherited money. Now my question is will they my in-laws be partner in my husband's money or property? Question posed by Dr. Romana that she is living with the husband, she has a daughter and there are many in-laws. The husband has sister, has got daughters and children to the sister and to the brother, also has his father alive. That's the father-in-law of Dr. Romana. The question is that if the husband has earned himself and not inherited anything, will they be partners in the property? If the question is that will they inherit from his property, then yes. As far as inheritance is concerned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid down the shares of the relatives who will inherit. And no one can change that. Allah has given, according to hadith, that one third of the inheritance of any person, he can will if he wills, if he wishes, to anyone who is not among the inheritors. But as far as the relatives are concerned, it is fixed. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 11 and 12, that as for the inheritance of your children, your son will get double, then share, double the share than your daughter. If only daughters, if one, she gets half. If only daughters, there are two, they share in a two-third after giving of the loans and the verse continues as for your parents if there are children each will get one sixth that means the mother will inherit one sixth the father will inherit one sixth if you have no children the mother will get one third the next verse of the quran surah nisa chapter number 12 continues and says that as in what you inherit from your wife the husband gets half if there are no children to the wife, after the wife dies, he will get one fourth if there are children. In what your wife inherit from you, after the husband dies, the wife inherits one fourth if there are no children, one eighth if there are children. For more details, you don't have to remember by heart, you can go and open the Quran, Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 11 and 12. Now here, will the relatives inherit? Yes. Most of the times, there are three categories of relatives who inherit. Number one is the parents, mother and father. Number two is the spouse. For the man, the wife will inherit. For the wife, the husband will inherit. And third is the children. That is daughter and, and son. So basically three categories, five types of people. Parents, mother and father, spouse, husband or wife, children, son and daughter. So mainly your parents, your spouse, your son and daughter will inherit. If the children are not there, then even the brothers inherit, the son inherit and the list goes on. It's also given in Surah Nisa chapter 4, 176 and there are various hadith. So the law of inheritance, mirat, it is very voluminous. But basically, your father-in-law is alive. If your husband dies, 
your father-in-law will inherit. Because you have got children, the father-in-law will get one-sixth of the property. You will get one-eighth of the property. So, so Allah forbid, if your husband dies, your father-in-law will get one-sixth, you will get one-eighth, and if you have only one daughter, whatever is remaining, she will get half. And but naturally later on, if anything is pending, goes to the sister, the brother of the person will die. And these are the shares ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have no option in that. You said that your husband has earned this money. All the wealth belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is his wealth. He has given to your husband, has given to us. So these shares are ordained. You cannot say because I love my son more, I will give him more. I love my daughter, I love, I will give him more. These are shares ordained. Outside those who are relatives, if you want to give, you can give one third of your share and the balance is divided by relatives. So this is the share or ordained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have no option to it. You have to follow as per the Quran and the Hadith. We are, running, we are running short of time. I'll just take one last question before we end the session. This is the last question. It is Assalamu Alaikum. I am Muhammad Rizwan from India, occupied Kashmir. May Almighty Allah bless you with what you want. Amin. Is reading human anatomy haram or halal in Islam? As in anatomy, we examine private parts of man and woman. Generally, reading anatomy and watching the private parts of man and woman is haram. But if you are studying, it is permitted. If you are studying generally physics or physiology in school, and then it comes, these diagrams are just illustrations. It cannot be an actual photograph of a man or a woman, it is prohibited, even in school. But if you have illustrations and just Without showing the details, it is okay. The human anatomy, what is the face, what is the thing, illustration is fine. But details, private part, it is prohibited. Unless you are a doctor. If you want to do medical studies to become a doctor, it is permitted. Because here, you are saving human lives. So when you are studying medicine to save human life, at that time you may have to learn the anatomy and maybe look at photographs or may look at... Uh, uh, statues of man or woman to understand what is surgery, what is the anatomy, so that when you treat the patient, you can do it very well when you treat a life patient. So when you are looking at a dummy or an image or a photograph to learn so that you can treat the patient as a medical student, it is permitted. Otherwise, reading anatomy just to understand, looking at private parts is prohibited. It is haram. You should not do it. In school, illustration without showing the details of private part of the human anatomy, okay. But photographs of private part is prohibited unless you are specializing in becoming a medical doctor, it is prohibited. Now we have run short of time. This was the last question I could answer. And inshallah, till we meet after two weeks. Because this was the last session of the fourth season. This was the sixth session. And as we normally have after the sixth session of every season, we have a break for one week. So next week we will not be having any program. Inshallah, we'll be having after two weeks. That is on the 15th of December. Inshallah, on Saturday, we meet at the same time, that 11.30 Malaysia. 6.30 Makkah time, 3.30 GMT. Till then, Assalamu alaikum, warahmatullahi barakatuh, wa akhiru dawan, alhamdulillah,